I'm going to invite your attention to the word of the Lord in the book of John, the Gospel of John, and chapter number 3, verses uh, 14 and 15. John chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. And do remember our night service tonight. Of course, it starts at 6.30. And um, we're expecting great things to be done. Of course, we come to every service expecting the unexpected. Always know that God is able to move and to meet the desires of our hearts. John chapter... 3 and verse 14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And so Jesus was lifted up on the cross. And I want to talk to you from this subject. The cross makes the difference. The cross makes the difference. Let's pray. Father, we thank you one more time for your loving kindness. Thank you for your power and your might. We thank you, O oh Lord, because you are the God of all the earth. And we thank you that you uphold the universe by the power of your word. And so we can, we can rest upon your word because your word is truth. And we love you, O oh God, because you first loved us. Thank you how you have brought us out of darkness into the marvelous light. You have revealed yourself to us. Put your holy word in our mouth. You've given us eternal life. Thank you for your word. David said, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Moreover, by the entrance of your word gives light to our heart. Our God, we thank you for that. Thank you that you are a shepherd. And how you have kept us, Lord, and you have... You have charted a course for us. And I thank you because you have been good to us, Lord. Thank you for this truth that you have revealed unto us. And I pray that our hearts will be indeed be encouraged. Lord, we take authority over this atmosphere and we bind everything that is unlike you. And we cast it down. And Lord, we re release in this place a spirit of truth and revelation faith lord that conviction will be had that people will see a word and turn oh god and be saved lord we understand the day in which we live that the end draws near and so lord we would urge those that are without you lord to come and to be saved touch the lips of clay i pray have your own way. Let your word go forth and be effective. Lord, we are just instrument of thine. And Lord, use us as oracles of your holy word. I pray that you would hear us, O oh God, and let your word go where it's intended to go today. And Lord, we know we will have the evidence and we will see, Lord, the result. And God, we will be careful to praise you and to honor you and to glorify you in the name of jesus christ we pray and everybody said amen heaven bless you and you may be seated the cross makes the difference in this particular interview with nicodemus nicodemus being a 
a ruler of the Jew, specifically a member of the Sanhedrin Council. Jesus began to answer an unspoken question in this man's heart. He came and of course he gave the Lord some commendation and the Lord really didn't pay too much attention to that because he knew that Nicodemus wanted to know how to obtain salvation, how he could be saved. In as much as he was a ruler and a leader in Israel, I think Nicodemus evidently was convinced that what he had received was not enough to take him to heaven. If he thought what he had was, was enough to take him to heaven, then of course he would not have sought out Jesus. But he came to Jesus and we're told that he came by night. Now whether that was because he was trying to um, evade the gaze in eyes of his friends, I don't know, but he came by night. And uh, I believe that is quite instructive. There are many honest-hearted people today who are in, in attendance in a religious setting, but I do believe that many of those people are going to come face to face with truth one of these days when they do not have Bible salvation. Many people can go to church, have big Bible, but at some point when they start to read the scriptures, see that the real problem comes when they begin to read the Bible. Because many people have Bibles, but they don't read it. But once they begin to read the scripture, then they will realize that what they have is simply inadequate. It will not take them to heaven. They know. I've talked to many people, and they, they, they tell me that when they start to read the scripture, then they know what they have is simply inadequate. It does not measure up to scriptural requirements. And the serious thing about it is all of us have to meet scriptural requirements. Now we look then that Jesus had informed Nicodemus about a birth, a supernatural birth of water and spirit in verse 5. And Jesus told Nicodemus that that was an absolute prerequisite to going into heaven. If you, Jesus said, if you don't have it, you're not going to heaven. And uh, the, thing about, the thing about it is this, is that if Jesus tell you you won't make heaven without it, it is true. Now, you may not believe me, but you, you got to believe what Jesus said because he's the one that came from him. So he knew all about it. And we look as the discussion proceeded, Jesus brings out an Old Testament passage of scripture to show Nicodemus what he, Jesus, would play in terms of salvation. So Nicodemus evidently had come to the right, the right source because Jesus was really the source of salvation. And uh, Jesus himself said he was the way, the truth, and the life. So to me, that was the best place to go. And then you have to allow that whatever Jesus said then you simply needed to comply. So I want you to allow me to mention three things for your consideration. Firstly, the background of the text that Jesus brought up. And this is in 
Numbers chapter 21. And I'm going to begin reading in verse number four. And obviously, once Jesus brought up this passage of scripture, or part of the narrative from Numbers, then Nicodemus was quite familiar with it. But in verse 4 of Numbers 21, it says this, And as they journeyed, and they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to come past the land of Eden, and the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. Verse 5, And the people spake against God and against Moses, Wherefore have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water, and our soul loatheth this light bread. And the Lord sent fiery serpents, verse 6, among the people. And they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. Verse 7, therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned. For we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent and set it upon a pole. And it shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. Verse 9, And Moses made a serpent of brass and put it upon a pole. And it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. So that was the background of what Jesus had mentioned to Nicodemus. Now I'm going to, I'm going to mention four things here as an observation from that passage. Fourth thing, first, we look at the cause of the problem. We see that the people had become discouraged because of the wilderness journey. And uh, verse four tells us that they had come from Egypt and they had come by Mount Hor, by the way of the Red Sea, to come past the land of Edom. And they were discouraged. And what was happening is that they were going all over the wilderness, it seemed. And it looked like they were going backwards instead of forwards. So understand that we've got about two and a half million people in this desert just at least it seemed to them that they weren't going anywhere. And so they began to complain to Moses. You will notice that when they came out of Egypt, that Moses had asked Edom, and Edom, of course, were cousins to Israel. And so they had asked them if they could come by their way, by, by their land, and to go up into uh, Canaan. And then you will notice that Edom was, was quite adamant about it. They said, no, we don't want you to come this way. You need to go someplace else because everybody is pretty much scared of Israel and said, Dude, no, we don't want you around here. If you notice in verse 18 of our previous chapter, verse chapter 20, verse 18, and Edom said unto him, Thou shalt not pass by me, lest I come out against thee with the sword. And the children of Israel said unto him, We will go by the highway. And if I, and any cattle, uh, 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 he says, We will go by the highway. And if I and my cattle drink of the water, then I will pay thee for it. I will only, without doing anything else, go through on feet. And he said, Thou shalt not go through and eat them came out against him with much people and with a strong hand. Thus Edom refused to give Israel passage through his border, wherefore Israel turned away from him. So they couldn't go through Edom, so then they have to go all the way south now and east to come back. And so the people 
just said, my goodness, we're just, we're just going all over this place. And so they become much discouraged, as the text says there, because of the way. So they complain about that. Then they also complain about the lack of bread. Verse 5. People speak against Moses and against against God and about Mo and against Moses. Wherefore have you brought us out of Egypt to die in this wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water. So they said, no bread, no water. We're going to die here. But the worst complaint, so they, they, they complain about how they were walking around, then there is no bread, no water. But the worst complaint is the latter part of verse 5. They said, and our soul loathed this light bread. That's the worst part in it. Now, the New Living Text says, says it this way. And we hate this wretched manner. The New International Version calls it detestable bread. We hate this, this bread. Detestable. It's bad. But I want you to note now why this thing was like that. A rejection of the bread was quite serious because... It really showed contempt for the God of heaven. This bread actually came from heaven. It wasn't baked in earth's oven. And nobody, there was no baker there. But God actually sent it down from heaven. So now when you start to call what came from heaven loathsome, detestable, or wretched, nothing good is coming out of that. Because it is an affront to God's grace and his kindness. So, we understand then that God took umbrage to that. God objected to that very vehemently. Jesus spoke of the manna that came down from heaven in the wilderness as a type of himself. So see how, see how serious this is. That bread that came down was a type of Jesus himself. He says, I am that true bread from heaven. John 6, verse 32 to 35. Then said Jesus unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which comes down from heaven and give life unto the world. Then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. 35. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Then if you go to verse 48. I am that bread of life. Verse 49. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which comes down from heaven that a man may eat thereof and not die. 51. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. Of course, the man is a type. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give him is my flesh which I will give for the life of the world. And then verse 58. This is that bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. So this bread then was a type of Jesus. So to reject it is really to reject heaven's bread. So this is why it was so serious. So then the bread then pictures Jesus as the bread of heaven. He is the nourisher. He is the sustainer of his people. So in complaining then, and you notice that the complaint became more and more egregious and more and more outspoken. So they start here, but they continue to complain. And they're complaining, well, the way is too long, it's too, too orderous, it is too, it's too hot. Then this says, moreover, this, we don't have bread, we don't have water, 
We have this light stuff here. We can't even take it anymore. We're sick of this. So that's the first thing. Second, as a consequence of this constant grumbling, disobedience, and unthankful spirit, the Lord sent these fiery serpents among them as a punishment for their sin. Verse 6. And the Lord sent, I'm back in Numbers 21, verse 6. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. So once these poisonous snakes started to bite the people, death was the result. We can note two things here. First, they were unable to rescue themselves. They were helpless. Fiery serpents coming, biting them. They couldn't do a thing. Then we also should note that the poison of the serpent was deadly. And there was no antidote. So that's a serious thing. So we need, we need to notice the complaining then brings these snakes. Deadly snake. So a good lesson to learn is that we really shouldn't complain too much because we don't know what God will send in us. The third thing we should notice here, the people repented. Once they realized the serious thing, once they realized how God saw it, once they realized how God reacted to it, once they saw how God responded to their complaining, then they repented, verse 7. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. So we notice then that there is repentance. Many times I would say that we are going to get in trouble with God. And for the most part, if you're human, sometimes you're going to do something wrong. Now, the thing that we should realize here, the only thing that is going to get God's attention is repentance. The only thing that will change God, cause God to change his mind is our repentance. When we have displeased God, we simply have to repent. We have to come to God and tell the Lord, Lord, we have sinned. We have done something egregious. We have done something outrageous. We have done something that is a, a, against your will. It's against your word, and we are sorry. In Psalms 51, verse 17, David says this. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou will not despise. In Acts chapter 3, verse 19, the apostle Peter says this, Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. Our sins are blotted out only after we repent. Some people just feel like God is just going to forgive them like that. Wrong. God only forgives us when we repent. So the condition for God's forgiveness is always, without equivocation, repentance. The fourth thing that we note from that setting in, in Numbers, the Lord gave a remedy. Whenever we repent, then God always has a remedy. If we don't repent, of course, it means there is never any remedy. Verse 8. And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, and set it upon a pole. And it shall come to pass, that everyone that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass, and put it upon a pole. And it came to pass, that if a serpent, if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. 
So the Lord gave the remedy. He says, get us, get a brass serpent, put it on a pole. If anybody is bitten, when they come, they look, then immediately they would be healed. So they were urged to look on this serpent in order to receive life. We should note that we're not given any, any other details regarding the look. Didn't say how long you have to look. Didn't say what position you had to be in to look. But it's simply that you need to look. So that means the look then had to be purposeful. It had to be deliberate. And really a response to faith. Faith in what the Lord had said. There was nothing inherently healing virtue in that serpent, but it's simply if you came deliberate to where that Paul was, you look with purpose, i.e., I need my healing, then God will do it. So it is faith in the Word of God. So the Bible tells us that faith comes by hearing God's Word. When we hear the Word of God, we put faith in it, God would clothe that word with flesh and it will come alive. And so it's, it is quite interesting then. So at God's initiative, the, cur the thing that was a curse became the basis of their salvation. The thing that was killing them, God said, I'm going to turn it around and I'm going to cause it to be your salvation. So God can take anything in our lives, though detestable, hurtful, or, or whatever it is, God can turn it around because his word is power. The Bible says wherever the king's word is, there's power. God can take the most innocuous, the most reprehensible thing, turn it around and be your salvation. And so, as the people had transform in their own thinking the gracious bread that God sent from heaven they had transferred it to be detestable food so by the same token God transformed the symbol of death into the source of life and deliverance most people even today once they hear about a serpent I don't care what culture once they hear a, a, a serpent, a snake, most people are pushing back from that. No, sir, I'm not going to deal with that serpent. No, no snakes, no, sir. It, it didn't matter how tough you were. Once you see that, wa that water uh, moccasin, once you see that diamond head coming at you, said, oh, Lord, have mercy. Up out of this place. You're not about to wrestle with any serpent, friend. But God took that serpent to make a, a, a symbol of it, put it on that pole, and I'm going to use it to deliver you from that. So that is what we're facing there. This was what Israel was facing. So that was the problem. Secondly, the bronze snake then is a picture of Jesus Christ. And I'm back into my text. Jesus said, as, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the son of man be lifted up. Jesus became sin for us at Calvary. When we see Jesus upon that cross, he was sin as it were placed as a spectacle before the world to see. And Jesus then was the antidote for sin. Just like those people were bitten by the serpent and Moses lifted up that serpent there in the wilderness, as soon as they begin to look, regardless of how bad it was, then they were healed once there was a purposeful look at that serpent. The serpent was lifted up and a purposeful look, friend, 
it made the difference. Jesus has been lifted up at Calvary. And if we would come and we would look at Jesus, him and every sin sick soul in this world can be healed. You said, well, how is it just coming to Jesus going to do the job? Well, we know then that this is true. The manna had to be eaten. And the snake had to be seen by Israel in order for it to be effective. For us, the same applies to us. We must look to the Lamb of God and we must eat that heavenly bread if we are going to partake of eternal life. All of us, all of us has been bitten by the serpent of sin. Here's what Paul says in Romans chapter 3 verse 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Everybody, if you're a son of Adam, if you're a daughter of Adam, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Every one of us. And how do we know that sin is so pervasive? Look at our world. Our world is in trouble because of sin. Now, people sometimes try to do all kinds of things, trying to remedy what ails our, our, our world. They have rehabilitation. They've got all kinds of social programs. They have all kinds of three-step plan deliverance. And yet sin persists. Yet sins continue. Men shoot men. Men kill men. People rape. People do all kinds of things. Why? Because sin is at the core center of all of that. Well, you said, well, not me. I don't sin. I don't maybe do a few little sin here and there. Well, all sin is still sin. <laughs> and sin is, sin is what causes us to do it. Everything we do wrong is because of sin. And we have a propensity to do wrong things. As I've, as I've often said, it's easier to do wrong things than it is to do right things. It's easier to lie than to tell the truth. And so what, what is at the core of all of that? Sin. Our world is in the throes of trouble and darkness. And we got all kinds of people trying to do this. We elect politicians. One politician says, well, I'm going to do this. I'm going to be, you know, what you want me to do. And by the time they get there, they're worse than the one that was, well, they replaced. So we know we can't believe them. And when we, when, we, when we examine our world, and I think if we were, if we're honest about it, if we, when we examine our world, our world is not getting any better. We say, well, we know more. Probably we know more, yeah. But we sin more. We find more innovative ways to sin. We, do, we are doing more to displease God now than any previous generation. I'll repeat that. We are doing more to displease God than any previous generation before us. So there is, there is a malady that really is affecting the entire population, the entire world. There is the germ of sin. And the poison is in everybody. And it is going to kill us if we don't get the antidote. It is serious. There is, no, there is no remedy. As Israel, back then when they were bitten by those snakes, those serpents, there was no remedy at all until God said, make a brazen serpent. And Jesus Christ is really what we need to focus on today. The Bible says this in Romans chapter 6 verse 23. For the wages of sin is death. Many people don't even think about dying until they get sick. Because as long as they're healthy, 
Some of them, they won't even want to come to church. Man, I got things to do. Got places to go. Got people to talk with. I'm not even thinking about church. Y'all go to church where you're just wasting time. Until he gets a report from the doctor, got cancer that's incurable. Then he's, he starts, could, could, could you pray for me? I mean, he be, he'll be at that church before church starts. He'll be a bother to that preacher. Understand that there is a germ that is in us that is going to kill us. It is going to take us down. Methuselah lived for 969 years and death took him down. One preacher said, every one of us has an appointment card right in our pockets. We're born with it. So we're born, but we have an appointment card Say, there's a day you're going to die. And every one of us is going to happen that way. And if the Lord doesn't come, every one of us in this room, at some point, they're going to be having our funeral. That's how serious it is. And you can tell me how healthy you are. And I'm going to still tell you that, friend, one day they're going to have your funeral. Yes, sir. One day we're going to have your funeral. You're healthy now, but one day you're going to die. That's the germ of sin. That's, what, that's what's at work. But Jesus is a remedy. Jesus is an antidote. Jesus has the answer. In back in Moses' time, that serpent on that pole was the answer. They just need to come, look, and live. Jesus has been has it raised up on Calvary? All we just need to do, come and look on Jesus. Lord, I'm coming. I'm filled with sin, but you're the antidote. You're the answer. You are, the, you are what I need, and I'm coming to you, and I'm asking you to take away this, this germ that is in me, that is pushing me, that is propelling me, that is forcing me to death. In Isaiah chapter 45, verse 22, the Lord said, look unto me and be saved all the ends of the earth. So God has a remedy. God has the answer. And so I'm so glad, my friend, that there was a remedy back in, in, in Israel for them. And I thank God that there is a remedy for us. Jesus said, as Moses lifted up the serpent back there, then I also will be lifted up here, and you can have a remedy or an antidote for your sin. Thirdly, we must believe on him. In our text, verse 15, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. So we said, we didn't know how long they had to look at that serpent. We didn't know what posture. It didn't mention what posture you had to be. Whether you had to be kneeling, whether you had to be prostrate. We, it didn't tell us. But we do know that you had to come deliberately to that serpent. You had to come with purpose. If you were just passing by, if you were just a casual pass by that you weren't really careful, then you wouldn't get any, any result. But you had to come purposely. You had to look in faith, and then you get a result. It's the same thing with that woman with the issue of blood. There were many people that were touching Jesus, but they had no, they had no res result. But when she came with purpose and touched it with a purpose, I need to be healed, then there's a result. When you come to Jesus, you have to come with a purpose. You have to come with a mind made up. You have to come realizing that Jesus is your answer, that Jesus is your antidote, that Jesus is your healer, that Jesus is your savior, that his grace is available to you. So how do we... Believe on him, for whosoever shall, whosoever believeth in him should not perish. Many people need to know that just a casual statement that I believe in Jesus is simply inadequate. Because many people say, 
I believe. Just a mental assent. Well, I want you to look at James chapter 2 and verse 19. James chapter 2 verse 19. Thou believest that there is one God. Thou doest well. Because it's a fact. The devils also believe. But it's not going to help the devil. The devil is not about to repent, even if he could repent. He's self-willed. He's not about to repent. So even if you said, well, I need to believe, uh, you know, mentally I believe. Well, that's, that, that's, not, that's not a big thing. Because, I mean, well, you, you'll say, well, I'm a little better than the devil. But, well, it's not helping the devil. So just say, well, I believe. It's not going to help you. You have to actively, pers you have to pursue after that. Because belief is going to cause you to do some things in order to procure what is available for you. You've got to do it. The Bible says faith without works is dead. You can just say, well, I believe. But the scriptural belief has more in it than just a mental say, I believe. Some people said, well, if you just hold up your hand and say you believe, then that's enough. Well, that's a lie because that's not in Scripture. If it's not in Scripture, it's not right. This is why whenever people tell you something, you need to ask them for chapter and verse. They can't give you a chapter and verse, then don't believe it. Notice, if you will, in Mark chapter 16, verses 16 and 17. He that believeth, so you, you see now, he that believeth and is baptized. So if you believe, the next thing is baptism. Because if you believe and not baptized, you're, gonna, you're not going to be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. So when you don't believe, of course, you won't be baptized. See, many people object to baptism and say, well, that's a work. Well, I'll, if it's work, then I better do it because the Bible says I need to do it. See, the word is always greater than man. When man tells you something, find what the word says. If the word contradicts what the man says, always believe the word because the word never passed away. <laughs> Verse 17. And these signs shall follow them that believe. It implies that if you don't believe, these signs won't imply won't follow you. In my name they shall cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues. So if you're a believer, you got to speak with new tongues. You said, preacher, well, I haven't speak with, spoken with new tongues, then you're not a believer yet. See, you, you can't do, people, people can't go over the scripture. You have to hear what scripture says because the Bible said you have to believe on me as the scripture says. Well you, well, you say, well, I, I, I haven't spoken in tongues, and, and, but I'm a believer. I'm going to heaven. Well, wrong. You're not going to heaven because you're not a believer. See, when you don't, your people don't have a problem with me. They have a problem with the scripture. So you have to go back to the person who gave the scripture and, and, and fuss with him. Don't fuss with me. I'm just reading the Bible. These signs shall follow them that believe. It implies these signs will not follow them that don't believe. That's what that means. So if you don't have the signs, then you shouldn't argue. You should understand that you simply do not believe yet. At least you're not, not to the extent that the scripture is holding up to you. And of course, what Jesus was saying, he said that, that he that believeth shall uh, are, are those that uh, believe will be baptized and then, of course, they'll speak with new tongues. Now, you need to know that this was the new birth that Jesus had been talking to Nicodemus all, all along. He had said that they needed, he needed a birth of water and a birth of spirit. When you speak with new tongues, that's a birth of spirit. When you're baptized in water, that's a birth of water. Notice in John chapter 7 now, verse 37 to 39. 
In the last day of the feast, that great day of the feast, and that is the feast of the tabernacles, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture had said, then out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. So if we come to Jesus and we believe on him, there is going to be some kind of result. We, simple, we simply cannot say we believe on Jesus and then there is nothing. When you believe on Jesus, something's got to happen. Someone has to see something. If you believe on me, as the scripture has said, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. Observe what the parenthesis says. But this spake he of the spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. So every man that believes on Jesus will receive the spirit. And if you, if you receive the Spirit, then out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. Now, when rivers of living water start to flow out of you, you got to feel some kind of difference. You got to know some kind of knowledge. You got to have some kind of experience. I mean, think about you just look at a river, a natural river that's flowing. Firstly, you will hear a noise. You'll see some movement. You, you, you'll see evidently some, some kind of a, a, a reflection of what's happening. It may clean the stones. It may move some leaves. But there's something that you can see. So when, when rivers of living water spiritually start to flow out of it, out of us, something's got to be happening. Somebody needs to see something. We need to feel something. We can't be just dead just like we were. It doesn't make sense. And so Jesus Christ then says, if you believe on me, you're going to have eternal life. So it, it really means that if we as people of God and sinners that's looking on want to have eternal life, we simply need to come to Jesus and repent of our sins and say, Lord, we want that living water. We want the living water. Don't, friend, don't come and leave as you came. You need to come and get the living waters. Lord, I hear you have living waters. I'm here. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I hear that you're giving away living water free. I am here for that living water. A failure to look on that serpent in the wilderness meant certain death. Just as a failure to look at Jesus today is certain death. The cross is what's going to make the difference. And I don't know, friend, how... You feel about it. I don't know where you are in your experience with God. But what I'm telling you today is that there is life if you look at Jesus. I'm telling you that there is an antidote for sin. I am telling you there is grace for our salvation. And that is given if we come and look on Jesus. There is an old song that says, if you from sin are longing to be free, look to the Lamb of God. We need to look to the Lamb of God. He has redeemed us. If you are wanting to be free, if you are desiring to be free, if you have come to a place in your life where you simply just don't know what to do, you've got problems that are as it were, insurmountable, I am telling you that there is a solution if you come to the cross. When the Lord allow you to come into a place like this, it is simply there is a remedy. There is a solution. There is an antidote. Jesus told Nicodemus, he says, I'm going to be lifted up. Nicodemus, if you want to be saved, I am going to be lifted up and this remedy is going to be there just like Moses' serpent provide a remedy. When I'm lifted up at Calvary, I will provide a remedy for your sins. Yeah. 
the weight of sin is such a is such a terrible weight at some point in our lives we should have a desire to get rid of this weight of sin and this weight of sin friend wherever you go it's always there there's some people that God has been dealing with they may go back into the club and they are in the club and the Lord is talking to them they know they ought not to be there, but they go back again, and God is trying to get a hold of them. God may be trying to have been getting a hold of your life for a long time, but perhaps you have, as it were, shunned that, that, that invitation. But I'm saying that you are here today, and Jesus is dealing with your heart. I'm going to ask you, are you willing to look to the Lamb of God? Are you willing to come to a cross and say, Lord, I am tired of how I've been living and I want to get rid of my sin. Though your sins be as scarlet, you could have lived in sin for 30, 40 years. I am saying that there is a remedy. When we look at Calvary, when we observe Jesus' death, it was for your sin and my sin. I took advantage. What are you going to do about it? In the words of the old songwriter, on a hill far away, stood an old rugged cross. It was the emblem of suffering and shame. But I love that old cross. But the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners were slain. And I'll cherish that old rugged cross. I'm going to cherish that old rugged cross. I'm going to consider that old rugged cross. My trophy is at last I lay down. And I'll cling to that cross. I'm going to realize that that cross, friend, that Jesus bore, that they hung him on, was for my sin. He went to Calvary not because he was sin of his own, but it was for your sin and my sin. When I realized that was true, then I said to the Lord, I'm going to, I'm going to change my life. I'm going to come to that place and I'm going to lay that down. And I'm going to take full advantage of the wonderful gracious offer that came from heaven. Jesus says, I am the true bread that came out of heaven. And that true bread that came out of heaven is really to help us to live after that. After we have taken, taken full advantage of the antidote for sin. You can't live if you're in sin. You're dying. In a natural we grow old. I mean, even if, uh, even if we feel like we are going to try and find the fountain of youth. Ever notice we're getting older. Ten years, and you, you're seeing yourself, so it doesn't really appear that you're getting older. But somebody who has not seen you in ten years, they say, oh, my goodness, you, you put on a few years. Why? It, we're getting older. We're, we're going towards death. That's where we're going, towards death. But, but when you come to the Lord, that spiritual life has life. Jesus said you shall never die. There is power of an endless life. When we, when we get the antidote of sin, when we, when we come and look to Jesus purposefully and with a determined heart, with faith in Calvary, there is a life that starts. This is what Jesus is talking about. This new life, this new birth, that life is going to start. That has the power of an endless life. That life will never die. Jesus said, he that believeth on me shall never die. Hallelujah to God. Friend, if I were you and I had not given my life to the Lord, I would do that today. Jesus, Jesus makes, he, make, he, he gives you a, I mean, he gives you a guarantee. If you come to him, 
He's going to wash all your sins away. He's going to take all of those sins and he's going to remove it from you as far as the east is from the west. And then he will give you the power of an endless life. He'll fill you with his spirit. His spirit will give you what you need to live in this life. And then you have eternal life in the world to come. So we can exchange our, our life that is heading towards death now. We can exchange it for life that is heading towards eternity. So Jesus said, he that believeth on me, I'm going to give you eternal life. We can stand. I'm done. I don't know, friend, if you're here, but I'm going to invite you to come to this altar. I'm going to invite you to come. Lay that life that you're living now. There's an old song that says, the cross, the old rugged cross makes a difference in a world, in a life that is filled with disappointments and woe. The cross makes a difference. That is the difference maker. If you're looking for peace and rest and life, why don't you come to this altar? Why don't you come and ask the Lord to help you? Why don't you come and tell him, Lord, I know that there is a death sentence in me, but I, I really want to have eternal life. I'm going to come and I'm going to repent. That's, that's, where you need to, that's where you need to start. I'm going to repent. The life that I've lived has displeased you. In numbers, they had complained. And they had, they had complained about, even the, about the bread from heaven. Fiery serpents were issued. People were dying everywhere. But God had a remedy. People are dying today. People are pressing their way into eternity unprepared. But Jesus has a, a remedy. Jesus has an answer. Why don't you come from where you are? 